This afternoon's sermon will be taken from Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, verse 18. <clears throat> Proverbs 29, 18. The wise man, by inspiration, writes, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I suppose that many individuals have taken this verse and defined the word vision as many times we see it today or as we understand it today, an expectation of the future, looking ahead and making proper preparations for the future, having vision or to look ahead and to see ahead and to make the appropriate uh, moves, uh, necessary arrangements so that we're prepared and we're ready. And of course, it is necessary that we have such a vision as individuals and as the body of Christ. But the word vision here is not referencing that kind of vision. The word vision here is a reference to the means by which inspired word of God is delivered. It is a reference to God's Word. Visions many times were the way in which God spoke to His prophets and inspired men of old times. Daniel saw visions. Uh, Solomon saw visions. God communicated to these men by means of visions sometimes. And he used other means by which he uh, spoke to the prophets and, and to the patriarchs uh, to communicate his word. But the reference here is made to God's word. So we could read it, where there is no word of God, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, also a reference to God's word, happy is he. So here we have a parallelism, which is popular in the Proverbs. It's a form of poetry. Uh, parallelism. This particular parallelism would be considered antithetical because the first phrase and the second phrase are showing a contrast. The first phrase says, if you have no word of God, you perish. The second phrase is, if you have word of God, you're happy. So there's a contrast between those who hear and have the word of God and those who, hear, who do not hear and do not have the word of God. Where there is no word of God, the people perish. Where there is the word of God, where there is a continual hearing and studying of the word of God, the Bible says that man is happy. Now with that clearly defined, I want to go back to that word vision that we defined earlier. Though this word vision does not mean what we many times refer to as vision as looking ahead and looking to the future and making preparations now that will help us in the future, that word it does not mean. But I think it would be a shame to disregard this verse in regards to that idea. Many people say, well, that word doesn't mean that. Therefore, we won't use this verse at all in regards to looking ahead or looking to the future. But I think it's necessary for us to look ahead. If we're going to have vision as we define looking ahead and make our proper preparations for today to be prepared for tomorrow and the days to come and the years to come, why wouldn't we look to a verse like this that says, if there is no word of God, we will perish? <laughs> it seems to me that that would be the first place we go before we look to what, we, what do we need before we look ahead to tomorrow. Right? So where there is no vision, the people perish. That truth is true no matter what instance or way in which we use that term vision. We obviously want to define it properly in accordance with the scripture and we've done that. But I want us to apply it to our vision of being prepared for tomorrow. Looking ahead. Making appropriate preparations today so that in the future we'll be ready for whatever comes. Obviously the first step 
is that our vision for tomorrow has to be in faith. That's what this verse teaches. Where there is no Word of God, the people perish. So if we're going to make any preparations for tomorrow, if we're going to make any preparations or uh, do anything that we're looking ahead for the year to come or the years to come, it must be done in faith. It must be done with God's Word in mind. And it must be done with the teaching of God's Word at the top of the list. Faith is the power of God to save, right? Romans 1.16 I'm not ashamed of the power of God for it, uh, or the gospel, for it is the power of God that leads man to salvation, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. So we have to have faith in the fact that the gospel saves. Any vision that starts without that is a dead vision. There are individuals today who have different visions for themselves and for their families. And sadly, there are individuals who have different visions for the church. Now, each local congregation can have different visions in the sense that they have different locations, different physical needs, different uh, spiritual needs for that matter. Every, every congregation is different. But when it comes to goal number one, preaching the gospel is priority number one. Because where there is no word of God, where there is no vision, the people perish. And so those who might have, there are individuals who have tunnel vision, for instance. They only see what they want to see. That's the reason when they are concerned about the future as they look ahead. They may see a, a decline in attendance. They may see a decline in Membership, they may see a decline in uh, youth or young people. That goes back to kind of what we started last uh, or two weeks ago in the sermon, You're Invited, right? That the gospel is God's power to encourage, invite, and save. And we have to have faith in that, that that works in order for any vision that we have for tomorrow or the years to come to work. Our vision, our vision for tomorrow needs to have faith that those who hear the gospel and believe it have been born again. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, the apostle says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, notice, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. That's that vision. Where there is no vision, there is no faith. <laughs> Where there is no uh, vision, there is nothing to save souls. Where there is no vision, there's no way to get individuals to be born again. There's no conversion without that incorruptible seed, the word of God. So if we're going to have a vision looking ahead into the future, we have to have the Lord's vision, His Word, the incorruptible seed. And we have to have faith. And of course that faith comes by hearing, and hearing the Word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. We need to have the faith in the power of that vision, the Word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 8 and 9. Paul says, But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. We need to have faith in the Word of God, and having such faith for our vision for tomorrow and the years to come and that the Lord will open up doors. Right? We need to have that faith in order for our vision for tomorrow and the years to come to be good, to, to not perish. We need to have faith in the Word of God to produce saved souls, but we also need to have faith in the Word of God that doors will open. Paul said a great door and effectual. Uh, uh, this is a great opportunity, Paul said. And he said, I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. Why? Because a door has been opened 
to do good, to preach the truth, to save souls, to encourage, to, uh, to bring back those who have fallen away. We don't know what that great door was, but we have to have faith that there's going to be doors open, don't we? And those doors are only going to open if we have vision. If we have the Word of God leading us and guiding us, and if we have the vision or the sight or the foresight to be ready when those doors do open. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. We have to have faith that when those doors open and that when we see a need that needs to be done, that the Lord will give us the strength to do what's necessary. Paul said the Lord will strengthen. Now the Lord's not going to strengthen people who don't want strength. And uh, there's more to wanting strength than just saying, Lord, give me strength. Right? We're not going to grow our hair out and be Samson. If you want strength, you've got to look for the opportunity and then go do something about it. And you might not be as strong today in your actions, but those actions will make you stronger for the next opportunity. The more you exercise, the stronger your muscles will be. The more you have personal Bible studies with individuals, the better you'll be next time. You may not be very good the first time. You may not be very good the second time, but the more you do it, the better you'll be. Whatever that opportunity is, whether it be personal Bible studies or inviting individuals to services, we know that doors will open and we need to be ready for those doors when they are open. We need to have the vision, that is God's Word to lead us and guide us, and we need to have the vision, the foresight to be ready when it does, you see. So we're not misapplying Proverbs 28 verse 19, we're defining it properly, but we realize that it has its place in this idea of looking ahead and being prepared for the future. But not only does our vision need to be in faith and guided by God's Word, we need to have a vision that is reasonable. There are opportunities that may seem like great and wonderful things. But those may be too big for a small congregation to handle. <laughs> it may be too big for one individual. It may be too big just because I'm a novice. Okay? We need to make reasonable goals for ourselves, in other words. Not to say that where there is big things, we need to leave them undone, and not to make excuses for leaving them undone. But we need to recognize that just because something's not a big deal, quote unquote, doesn't mean we can't do anything. A lot of people say, well, we're too small to do that, we're too small to do this, and then that's it. <laughs> well, maybe that is the case, but we're not too small to do little things, right? There's nothing wrong with a series of small successes. Sometimes small successes go unnoticed, and that's sad. But the Lord sees them. God sees them. In a congregation our size, we all see them. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with a series of small successes, doing little things, doing them well. And when the opportunity comes for something big, I don't have anything to define as big, but when an opportunity or a door opens, if we're ready, then we need to open the door. But we don't need to get down or feel like we're doing nothing when we're doing small things, because sometimes small things are extremely important things. For instance, in my sermon a couple of weeks ago on the invitation, that was one of the main points. A lot of people overlook inviting because that's not big enough. Yet it is God's way of doing it. <laughs> we, 
which is which means that's as big as it gets. If God, if that's God's only way of attraction, of attracting individuals to services, then that's the only way. That's the big thing. That is the biggest thing. You can't make it any bigger than God made it. If you did, we're wrong. That's the reason it would be wrong to make the church any bigger than the church. That's the reason local congregations don't come together and meet in synods or councils because that would be an organization larger than the church and God didn't make it that way. So if we make something bigger than God made it, we're wrong. So we need to eliminate that. But just because we're doing something that may seem small or minuscule doesn't mean that it's not a success and that it's not working and that it's not visionary. As I mentioned, many people have tunnel vision. They want to do things their way and they want to do things on their time and they only have one idea of what they want to do. And perhaps invitation doesn't uh, fit in that mold. That's not enough, the world says. The religious world says that's not enough. I uh, noticed on a couple of uh, quote-unquote church websites just in passing through looking at uh, different websites. Some who have a time for their morning service and their Bible class and their Wednesday evening service. And some have, right before morning Bible class, breakfast. <laughs> I don't guess there's anything wrong with Christians getting together for breakfast. But it wouldn't shock me if that one little thing would lead to something bigger. That it, would, it shouldn't be or shouldn't be added to. It's not, the, it's not the church's responsibility to open up a breakfast house, right? An IHOP. <laughs> but people have a vision, right? And they say, wow, what if we opened up an IHOP? And they probably wouldn't call it that, right? But you know what I'm saying. And that's basically what they're doing. Or that's what it will have become, even though they might have good intent. Congregations with coffee houses basically have a Starbucks in their foyer, right? Their vision is go big or go home, right? Do it the world's way or don't do anything at all. They have tunnel vision. They have the wrong kind of vision. You can have the wrong kind of vision. And the wrong kind of vision starts with an absence of Proverbs 28 and 19. If you, if you forget that the true vision where there is no word of God, the people perish, then any other vision is worthless. Any vision that puts the word of God second or third or fourth or not at all is a vision that's bound to fail in eternity. But our vision needs to be reasonable. It needs to be reasonable based upon the fact that, hey look, we don't always depend on ourselves, right? When it comes to doing the work of the Lord, there are other people involved. There's the audience. Luke 8 uh, tells us of different soils that the, that the seed can fall on. You and I can attempt to plow that soil and to work that soil and till that soil, but that soil really has to make its own decisions. And we can't be held accountable or responsible for that. We can only be, only be held responsible for sowing the seed. But to some, sowing the seed is too small, too minuscule, right? And that leads to our next point. And that is, our vision needs to have specific action. It needs to be reasonable, and then there needs to be specific action. That means something to do. Not something to think about. See, a lot of people when they think, say, we've got a vision. Well, the vision never gets accomplished because they never implement action. We implement action. We do sermons like you're invited. And we say that's God's means of attraction and God's means of getting individuals to services. And so we invite individuals. We act upon our vision. 
Our vision is to grow, so what do we do? We invite people. We send uh, brochures. You may want to take tracks home, keep them in your vehicle. A door may open. Somebody uh, that you've never met may mention religion somehow or mention where they attend church and you can simply say, hey, I go to church at the Knox County Congregation. Come visit us sometime. That's a door of, op a door of opening, isn't it? It's a small door. But it's worth accepting, it's worth taking. We need to make special, specific acts. And maybe having brochures and, uh, and things in our car, tracks, will allow us to, to open that door immediately. It may mean to get that individual's uh, address. Would you mind if I get, get your address so I can mail you an invitation or mail you something? They may say no. That's okay. But they may say yes. So then not only did you open that door and invite them, but now you've got an opportunity to make a specific act of following up. And that's a specific action. So in our vision of wanting to grow, we do specific acts. We invite. We have brochures readily available. We, act, we, uh, we look for opportunities to follow up. A person who's been invited once may not come, but a person that is invited a second time might come. You never know. But it's worth a shot, isn't it? Don't let individuals make excuses. <laughs> I think I've gotten rid of everybody's excuses to the point where I think some people get mad at me. They might say, well, I don't have any transportation specific act I'll pick you up I'll pick you up well I live a long way away I don't care that's specific act number two I don't care how far away you live see you can make specific acts now a sincere individual may say okay come pick me up but don't let individuals make that excuse and let's get them give them an opportunity to get away with it Now, as it was the case when we pointed out in our sermon on the invitation, any opportunity we have to invite is a success, even if no one shows up. But if we're all doing our job, the law of averages tells us that we're going to have a visitor somewhere down the road, <laughs> right? Somewhere down the road, someone's going to attend. That truth has been proven here time and time again. The more opportunities that we invite, the more opportunities we have for people to show up. We have people that show up from out of town primarily due to our website, the invitation that we, the information that we place on the website. But when we have gospel meetings or anything like that, we've rarely had a gospel meeting where at least once during that uh, meeting, we didn't have at least one person show up who is from the community or from another congregation. You might have a specific act of your own. You might decide on your own to give a tract to one person a week. Not a day, but one a week. A welcome brochure. congregation of 25 or so hand out one track a week that'd be what 400 a, a month 25 no 200 a month 200 invites a month and of course that invitation entails the gospel because that's where the true vision lies isn't it where there is no vision the people perish in Romans chapter 10 Romans chapter 10 God sets forth this process this, uh, this specific action taking 
he gives the terms of the st specific action and the necessity of the specific action. That is, in how to spread the gospel. In verse 13, the Bible says, whosoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now verse 14 tells us that verse 13 means much more than to say, I believe in the Lord. Because you can say, I believe in the Lord without a preacher. You can say, I believe in the Lord without hearing the gospel. You can say, I believe in the Lord without even having faith in one iota of the scripture. You can say, I believe in the Lord. So verse 13 doesn't mean just saying or calling upon the Lord to save you. Whatever calling upon the name of the Lord means in order to be saved includes belief, which comes from hearing, because if you can't hear, you can't believe, and you can't hear without someone teaching. Verse 15, how shall they preach except they be sent? That's an action, isn't it? Now we're sent into the world every day. Right? We might be sent to the food city. <laughs> we might be sent to the get our car oil changed. We can drop off a brochure. We can meet somebody there and say we'd invite you to services. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Why? Because where there is no gospel, the people perish. Proverbs 28 verse 19. Now look at verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Isn't that why we're here? To bring about faith in the hearts of individuals so that that faith can grow and that they can obey and that they can be saved. So our vision needs to be surrounded by the fact that where there is no word of God, the people perish. But where there is the law, the people are happy. So when we look into the future, it needs to be centered around God's Word and God's law. Our vision needs to be reasonable in that we make reasonable goals for ourselves. Goals that can be achieved one little one at a time. And if there's a bigger goal that we can, that we can take on, do it. And have specific actions ready to go. And we do. We have brochures printed. We have a newspaper ad that runs once every three weeks. We have our sermons online. We have all manner of aspects that have us ready to make specific steps. Our vision needs to be bold. This was obviously a virtue that was witnessed during the early church in studying the book of Acts under Brother Terry we find that those early brethren relied heavily on prayer with God and the more that they did, the stronger they became and the more bold they became. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, the Bible says, When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that had been with Jesus. Acts 9, verse 27. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And we could go on and so forth. Acts 13, verse 46. Acts 14, verse 3. Acts 19, verse 8. Acts 28, verse 31. And we see that they spoke the word of God boldly. Why? Because they believed it. And when we preach, when we preach boldly and people say they believe that, that will cause some individuals to say, why do they believe that? And as Brother Keith pointed out in his class this morning, that may lead people to ask questions. And when people ask questions, that's a door of opportunity. But how did that door of opportunity start? It started with us saying the truth 
firmly and boldly. Our boldness is not based upon arrogance. Our boldness is not based upon uh, self-reliance. Our boldness is not based on self-competence. Our boldness is based upon the hope that is given to us by Christ. We know that God never lies. (laughs) And we know that God's Word is truth. And we know that God says what He means and means what He says. And God fulfills all His promises. To say what needs to be said when it needs to be said, even when that may not be the most profitable thing in our mind to do. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul by inspiration says that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Don't be shaken in mind and don't be troubled. How many times, unfortunately, I've seen individuals that I know knew the truth. But when the time came to present that truth, they were shaken. I don't think we should do that. I once heard a man say, after he knew the truth, he gathered some truth. He knew what needed to be said, but when the time came, he shook. He was a coward. He was a spiritual coward. And because of that, other compromisers received strength. He helped strengthen people who were going to compromise the truth. The Lord says, don't be shaken. When do you need to be bold? (laughs) You need to be bold when we're scared. That's the time we need to be bold, isn't it? We need to be bold when there's a time to be bold. It's easy to be bold when everybody around you believes what you believe, isn't it? That's easy. We need to be bold when we know that our boldness may be questioned. And lastly, our vision needs to be persistent. Just as our desire to spread the gospel needs to be persistent. And the necessity of the vision or the word of God uh, being persistently taught because without it, the people perish. We need to be persistent in teaching the word and teaching the law because that's when people are happy. And without it, the people perish. Hosea said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Hosea 4.6. How does a lack of knowledge occur? Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. You quit knowing the truth when you quit hearing the word. When you eliminate word of God from your life, you become dumber spiritually. You want to become smarter and stronger spiritually? You need more word of God, not less. And so we need to persist in our own learning and understanding. We need to persist in our own teaching so that others can have that knowledge. Not losing heart because the Bible says we shall reap in due time. Galatians 6 verse 9. Always abounding, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58, knowing that our labor is not in vain. That's the reason we don't give up. Now our labor sometimes seems like it's in vain. Why? Because the devil steals some of the seed and people don't hear it and they don't believe it. Sometimes the cares of the world, the riches of the world chokes out people, chokes out the seed and they don't believe and that discourages us. Right? But we don't need to get so discouraged because we know that ultimately we're working for the Lord. And the Lord said always abound in good works. Always abound in in this labor because your labor is not in vain. Many visions are never realized because people give up. And if you give up, then you are, you are bound not to achieve. <laughs> That's the only guarantee there is in life, really, other than death, that if you quit, you will not achieve it. You will not achieve. So uh, Proverbs 28, 19. 
antithetical parallel. Where there is no vision, there is no Word of God, no revealed Word of God, the people perish. But where there is the law, the people are happy. We can apply that to looking ahead today, I'm convinced. And we can do so scripturally, and we can do so uh, understanding what the true nature of the text and the context is. Because when we look ahead to the future, we make plans today for tomorrow, and we look for a, uh, preparing for, to, for years down the road, it has to be God-centered. It has to be centered around the Word of God. It has to be centered around doing what God says and about doing the work of the Lord, and that is bringing people to Christ and doing it His way. So, our vision as we leave this building this afternoon, obviously to grow in spirit, to grow in faith, to grow in strength, to grow in number, right? And we know the only way to do that is to grow in the Word of God and be persistent in teaching the Word of God because where there is no Word of God, the people perish. If you've not yet obeyed the Gospel, the invitation is open. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. The Word leads us to repent, confess, be immersed in water to have our sins washed away. The Lord adds those individuals to His church. If you've already obeyed those initial acts and have some other need, the invitation is open to you as well. If you have something separating you from God and it's a private nature, take care of it privately. If it's of a public nature, we'll assist you if we can as we stand and sing.